I'd like to begin by uh, thanking the organizers and thanking the uh, Fetzer Foundation for having invited me. I'm very excited for the opportunity to be at uh, another one of these visionary conferences and honored to be part of uh, this group of presentations. And today, indeed, I want to tell you about probing surreal elements of quantum physics, and uh, you'll see little by little what I mean about those. You'll also notice, for those of you who have been following the literature on weak measurements, that I'm going to tell you about how you can flip a coin and find 100 heads. Well, I didn't count, but something close to 100 heads in any case. But before I do that, uh, I found it very interesting yesterday listening to the more philosophical talks and finding myself agreeing with each camp that was being presented until I was demonstrated that they were in contradiction with one another. And it's the same thing that happens to me whenever I get in a discussion about foundations, that at first I think, oh yeah, realist, that's, that's me. And then someone else explains something about operational. It's, yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. I, maybe I'm that too. And then as it begins to not make too much sense, I start to think, maybe I just don't really understand what the words mean. And I have someone like John Seip define the words for me very carefully again. And, and then I think, no, that wasn't the problem. Maybe I just don't know what I think. And at the end of the day, I'm left not even being sure whether I don't know what I think or whether I don't know what the words mean. Uh, and today I'm going to be telling you about Bohmian mechanics in particular, which makes a lot of people think that I'm some adherent of Bohmian mechanics. So I want to begin by making clear my perspective is pure and straight agnosticism. I have no idea what the right interpretation is. This is not a talk about Bohmian mechanics. It's a talk that I like to think of as being from the perspective of, uh, in Howard Wiseman's words, a naive experimentalist, comma, with no knowledge of quantum mechanics. The comma is important. Um, <clears throat> So that's me. I think of myself as someone doing the measurements, trying to interpret them. We can talk about quantum mechanics later if you like. We can talk about Bohmian mechanics. But in the end, the feeling that I have is if there is some deeper theory underlying quantum mechanics, the kind of thing many of us are seeking, then it's something that should in part be revealed by the kinds of measurements that we're doing. Whether that theory be Bohmian mechanics or something else, the elements that are directly exposed by experiment had better illuminate it. So whether you love Bohmian mechanics or hate Bohmian mechanics, I hope you'll find something interesting <clears throat> in the measurements that we're talking about. So there are three things I'm going to try to tell you about. We've been working on data compression, so I'm hoping I can fit them into 45 minutes. Uh, the first is going to be non-local Bohm trajectories, these trajectories that have been dubbed surreal. I'll explain to you how one can measure trajectories in a certain averaged sense. I'll talk about Velkovec detection and what it means for these so-called surrealistic trajectories and demonstrate the non-locality of experimental Bohmian, if you like, trajectories and how we observe it. Secondly, I want to tell you how you can count a single photon and get a result of eight. Those of you with a good memory for titles will know what I'm referring to there. Uh, I'll introduce some ideas about giant optical nonlinearity, something that's been of interest to the quantum optics community forever. It's been an obsession of mine since my advisor first transmitted the obsession to me over 20 years ago, and is now very exciting to people in the quantum information community. But I think it has some aspects related to weak measurement that should cause us to think a little bit as well as practical as, uh, aspects related to signal-to-noise measurement, doing precision measurements. And finally, I'll talk about some work that's underway. I've now been saying that for 19 years, but it's 19 years closer than it was 19 years ago, uh, which is whether or not we can ask where a tunneling particle is while it's tunneling, again, using weak measurement. So uh, let me show you a photo of the group and the people who participated over some of the years. And in particular, I'd like to thank the uh, students who really did this work, who were responsible in particular for the Bohmian work, which began with Boris Braverman and Sasha Koksis, and the most recent uh, iteration, Dylan Mahler, Lee Rosema, as well as help from uh, Howard Wiseman and from Kevin Resch's group, who are on the front page, and a number of the other experiments, in particular the tunneling experiments, due to Shreyas Potnis, Ramon Ramos, David Spearings, and the single photon work with Matin Halaji, Amir Fez, Pour, Josiah Sinclair, and Greg Dmochowski. So let us begin with the surreal Bohm trajectories. <clears throat> Obviously, we all know what a classical trajectory is. If we can describe the position and velocity at every time, we know exactly where the particle is and how fast it's moving at every other time. To measure it, we could imagine just measuring the position at a series of times for instance. Or if we had an ensemble of particles and we're doing destructive measurements, as is often the case in quantum mechanics, we could imagine measuring what the velocity is for a particle at each position and doing this at different times, 
and then eventually connecting the dots to figure out what set of trajectories the particles in this distribution had been following. Now, you'll notice a subtlety in this picture, which is there are a number of places where the trajectories cross, and that's not always possible. In particular, in any theory with a hydrodynamic structure, such as the Bohm theory, in particular because the direction is a single-valued function of position, there is no crossing. If I measure the velocity right at that supposed crossing point, I would get one result or another, so I could not have two trajectories do that. <clears throat> And the way our experiment is designed, as you'll see, we also fundamentally cannot get crossing trajectories. So it automatically agrees with this Bohmian structure. Although if we're careless and we skip too much time from this point to the next, we could of course fool ourselves. So it's an experimental detail to be careful to have enough precision not to get those errors. I will mention though that this depends only on position is cru crucial. And already in multiparticle Bohm, the direction depends not on position in real space, but in configuration space, the positions of all the particles. Therefore, the trajectories may cross in real space without crossing in this deeper configuration space. All right. As far as the uh, experiment, it goes back to work of Wiseman's on grounding Bohmian mechanics in weak values and Bayesianism, where Howard pointed out that even though we can't directly measure the trajectory of an individual particle in quantum mechanics, since we can't measure the positions at different times with precision, we could measure the position at one time conditioned on the position at another time. In particular, we could make a weak measurement of where the particle is at time t1, post-selected on finding it at some particular x at t2, and then draw an arrow connecting those two positions. And what he discovered is that if you build up a set of trajectories by doing this, and again, connecting the dots, what you get is precisely what's predicted by the Bohm theory. We realized that you can do it a slightly different way, which was technically easier for us, which is that at each time you could measure the momentum, make a weak measurement of the momentum, post-selected on a particular position, and that way directly correlate the velocity and position fields, and again, connect the dots. Both of these yield the same result. Um, it gives us basically the probability current as a function of position, but that is, of course, the Bohm trajectories. So with the weak measurement, at each post-selected point, you find some momentum, some direction. And when you put them together, you have this velocity field in one plane or at one time. And if you go ahead and do this at other times, you can rebuild the trajectories. And imagine in, for instance, a two-slit interferometer reconstructing where the particles move to form that famous interference pattern. So let me explain how we do this experimentally. There are a few mappings that are important. Uh, we don't use electrons or massive particles. We're using photons right now. That may raise some interpretational issues for some, but remember, I'm a naive experimentalist. Photons, electrons, they behave the same way in the end. I'm interested in what we get out of our measurements. Uh, time in typical optical experiments gets translated into distance along the propagation axis. <clears throat> position is actually going to be the horizontal transverse position of the photon. Momentum is then really just the direction of photon propagation since the length of the momentum vector is fixed. It's omega over c. All we care about is the direction. I'll use those as synonyms. And for a pointer in order to carry out this measurement, <clears throat> excuse me, we will use the polarization of each propagating photon. That way, every photon carries its own pointer device, making it straightforward to post-select on the position of the photon. You simply look at photons at a given position. You ask, what is their spin? What is their polarization? And that tells you <clears throat> what you measured for the photon that landed at that position. Of course, we need this von Neumann interaction, the coupling of the momentum px, which we want to measure, to some operator relating to the probe, to the pointer. And in our case, we use a calcite crystal down here, which is a birefringent crystal, and it can rotate the polarization. But if you look at the details, the exact value of that rotation depends on the angle of propagation of the beam. So in this way, by looking at the polarization angle, we get a record of what that propagation direction was. So we have a two-slit interferometer. Photons from a cooled indium gallium arsenide quantum dot are emitted, split at a fiber beam splitter. They come off this mirrored prism, which essentially turns the output faces of our two fibers into a virtual double slit. These propagate in free space, other than some optics used to image the relevant planes onto our CCD camera, going through this calcite crystal that allows us to couple the polarization to direction. <clears throat> 
And then at the end, we have to read out that polarization. And what we're going to do is look at photographs on a CCD camera of the interference pattern. But we have an additional degree of freedom. We have the vertical dimension. The interference pattern is going to be a horizontal set of stripes. So what we can do is use a polarizing beam displacer, which just splits the polarization in two, displaces one upward, so that we get two nearly identical copies of our interference pattern, but one for horizontal polarization and one for vertical. We begin with an equal mixture, and every rotation will tend to imbalance that mixture. So the imbalance between those two patterns will be our readout of the pointer. So this is a movie. It's not the best data we have, but it's the best movie I have. So what you're looking at here is the CCD screen. From left to right, you see the interference pattern, except I'm still in the near field. So what you really see is slit number one, slit number two. And as promised, you see two copies. The lower copy is horizontal. The upper copy is vertical. They should be identical. We're going to propagate through the different planes as each of these wave functions spreads out, begins to overlap and interfere with the other. And what you'll see plotted down here, in the green and the red are the profiles of these two different polarizations. You see they're nearly identical, right? They're just the intensity profiles of those four spots. The blue, however, indicates the difference, which means that it's indicating the measurement of the propagation direction. It's zero when the photons are propagating on axis, <clears throat> positive when they're moving to the right, negative when they're moving to the left. And you see already that this spot is beginning to diffract out. The right side is moving to the right, the left side to the left. Um, I apologize in advance. The scale is going to change so that we can keep the whole image on the screen as we propagate. So it'll look like the spots are moving in towards each other. But really, it's just the diffraction as they approach the interference region. <clears throat> You're going to see them begin to overlap, and suddenly more interesting things happen. You watch the blue curve. And in each plane, that's now demonstrating momentum as a function of position, allowing us to reconstruct this whole set of rather messy-looking trajectories. Here are the better data. Again, very sensitive to uh, conditions at each plane, but you still get the idea of these non-crossing trajectories that, as they begin to collide, build up an interference pattern in the far field. So this was our experiment in 2011. <clears throat> but from the beginning, from when we first thought about the experiment, what we really wanted to do is address this old puzzle due to Scully, Engel, Zussmann, and Walter, known as surrealistic bohm trajectories. And this was a paper that built on ideas that those groups had had of how to do which path measurements in order to do things like quantum erasers or study whether or not momentum disturbance was indispensable for destroying interference. What's more fundamental, complementarity or the uncertainty principle was the way the debate was often phrased in those years. And although this is a poor quality reproduction, their idea came down to this. You could imagine building an atom interferometer with atoms that before they went through the two slits, went through two micromaser cavities, the kinds of things that Walter was famous for and Arroche won the Nobel Prize for recently. Uh, the cavities are invisible in this plot for some reason, but trust me where the words cavity are, there should be cavities. If you set the system up correctly and begin with excited atoms, excited Rydberg atoms, for instance, you can nearly guarantee that an atom propagating through one cavity will leave a photon behind in that cavity, <clears throat> thereby leaving a record of which slit it traveled through. Yet it does this without any appreciable momentum kick. So they got very interested in what that meant for the interference. In this particular case, however, they analyzed how a Bohmian would think about this experiment. And they argued that since we know, remember, that Bohmian trajectories cannot cross, they know that when you see this interference pattern, in fact, every spot on the lower half of the interference pattern comes from a particle which went through the lower slit. And every path which terminates in the upper half of the interference pattern began at the upper slit. All right, all well and good so far, a little surprising, but well known at this date. However, they also recognize that now by adding a which path detector, they introduce the possibility that the upper which path detector fires. In other words, a microwave photon is deposited in this micromaser, and yet that the particle lands down here. And in their more or less experimentalist biased or classical biased view of things, one would often expect that this particle simply propagated in a straight line down to that point. Nevertheless, the Bohm trajectories say that in fact the particle came from here. <clears throat> this is what they dubbed surrealistic. Most experimentalists at the time, I think, would have agreed with them. I hope even most non-experimentalists would have agreed with them, whether they were right or not. Um, and they would think that the particle really went through the path where the photon appeared. And if the Bohm trajectory said something different, 
then the bomb trajectory wasn't describing what really happened. Obviously, you don't have to believe that. You can defend the bomb trajectory and say that's just how nature is. But it was surprising. It made it seem less likely to many people on the fence that the bomb picture would be a useful way of getting at what was really happening. There was a huge amount of debate about this. There are many issues that I will not go into. Um, on the other hand, one particular way of thinking about it is to recognize that multiparticle Bohmian mechanics is non-local. In other words, there is an influence on the interfering particle of the particle that stored the witch path information, and vice versa. There's an influence as the interfering particle propagates on the stored particle. In particular, it's possible for the particle to go through the lower slit, deposit a photon in the lower slit. I shouldn't talk about photons because now I want to talk about Bohmian particles. It's possible for the photon to trigger a detector that will indicate that it went through the lower slit and then have the Bohmian particle of that detector move to the upper slit. Simply seeing at the end of the day that the record says upper slit does not guarantee that while the particle was traversing the slit, that's what the record said. The record itself can change as a function of time. So again, I'm not gonna cite the uh, huge literature on, on all of this, <clears throat> and I'll leave aside subtleties about uh, whether there are Bohmian trajectories for photons or for the electromagnetic field in some other sense, and what they are, let alone for polarizations, which is what we're actually gonna be using to do our, our measurement. Again, I'm the naive experimentalist. I'm telling you what happens in the laboratory. We can argue later about what it means. Uh, some of the directly relevant literature, though, is here. Here's a paper by Marlon Scully with this kind of picture of an atom traversing um, cavity number two, depositing a photon, which then magically moves to cavity number one as the Bohmian trajectory of that atom gets reflected. Uh, work by Heisel, uh, Haile, Callahan, and Moroni over here on quantum trajectories, real, surreal, or an approximation, uh, demonstrating in particular exactly where the non-locality arises, and Howard will talk more about this later. And most recently, uh, one of our co-workers on the original experiment, Boris Braverman, teamed up with Christophe Simon to uh, do this nice paper on what would have happened if we'd been able to do that experiment on entangled photons. So a source that emits two photons in opposite directions, so that photon two already has a record of which direction photon one is going, but then both photon one and photon two can be sent through interferometers. And the way they tried to highlight the nonlinearity is to point, that, point out that if you insert a phase shifter in the interferometer here on the left for photon two, you can directly see the effect of your choice of phase shift on the Bohm trajectories for photon one, an instantaneous effect. So we decided finally to set up an experiment to mimic this. Uh, for technical reasons, we weren't able to do the pair of spatial interference patterns and directly correlate them. So instead what we did is simply use the polarization of photon two as a record of which way photon one went. And the way we did this was to begin with two polarization entangled photons from a Sanyak source pictured here from Kevin Resch's lab and take one of those photons, use a polarizing beam splitter to convert polarization into path. So if it had been H, it takes the left path. If it had been V, it takes the right path. But photon two remembers, and it now remembers which path was taken. Of course, I say remembers, but one could erase that information. If one found the photon at 45 degrees, one could only say, well, there were equal amplitudes for H and V at the source, and therefore I'll restore my interference pattern, which is what we end up doing. So here's the interference, uh, the interferometer, constructed in much the way I showed you before. Again, these two sets of interference patterns, except that now we add a fast electro-optic switch so that only when we see a post-selected photon two do we open this gate and let the photons land on the CCD. So we can accumulate a coincidence image with a chosen polarization for that pointer photon. And here are the results. Again, when photon two is detected with a certain phase, an equal superposition <clears throat> of upper and lower slits, we see these nice interfering trajectories. On the right-hand side, they build up the interference pattern. And as we're doing that, we've built up these momentum distributions in different planes. Now, what you see is in the near field, here we see this momentum distribution where they're just beginning to collide. And as we change the phase, of the post-selection for photon two, that's plotted in different colors. It has very little effect while we have non-overlapping distributions. But once we go into the far field where there's interference, 
These are the momentum distributions we get. And you notice they get completely shifted as a function of that post-selection phase. So at each point, the momentum that photon one carries depends on the phase that we're doing our measurement on photon two with. So we can, in fact, reconstruct entire trajectories beginning at the same initial condition for different values of that photon two phase. And you see that the photons go in entirely different directions. Photon two has an immediate effect on the propagation direction of photon one in this trajectory sense. So to come back to how one might resolve this question of surrealism, where did the record actually go? Where did the photon actually come from? <clears throat> we can look at a trajectory that lands at a particular point over here, where the Bohmian trajectory clearly says it must have come from the lower slit, and track along the way what the polarization of the other photon is as this photon propagates. So what we do is we image each point in this, uh, we image each plane and pick the point along this trajectory and correlate that with all possible polarization measurements, or I should say a tomographically complete set of polarization measurements on the other photon. So we can reconstruct what its polarization was as it propagates. And that's shown in color here. It begins blue and it goes to orange. And if you look on the block sphere for that photon, you see that it began at the lower slit as we expected, which is vertical polarization. But as this photon propagates into the interference region, that polarization begins to evolve until by the end, the polarization is equally H and V, meaning that we're just as likely to find photon two horizontal as vertical. The record has been destroyed. All right, so that was enough on Bohmianism. Now I want to tell you about a more recent uh, bit of surrealism that we carried out. I'm gonna show you how to count to eight on a single photon. Um, give you a little bit of background. <clears throat> We're very interested in quantum nonlinear optics. My view of this is that all of interesting optical physics since roughly 1960 has either had to do with the rich effects that you get with nonlinear optics or with the fascinating effects you get in the quantum regime. But because nonlinear optics typically involves pulses with billions or trillions of photons to build up a strong enough interaction, those have never been carried out until recently in the truly quantum regime. Getting large enough nonlinear interactions that you could see these rich effects at the level of two or three or six photons where we do quantum mechanics opens up an entirely new realm, in addition to quantum logic gates as in this proposal by Monroe and Nomoto. So the idea that we have in mind is demonstrated schematically here. If there's some black box known as a cross-phase modulation medium, where when a signal photon goes through, that causes a phase shift in some probe, we can interferometrically measure the phase shift on the probe and do a quantum non-demolition measurement of the presence of that signal photon. How does that work? Well, if a probe photon is sitting on some atomic transition, there's a dispersive profile to the index of refraction, meaning that the phase picked up by the photon is a strong function of its frequency, or rather it's detuning from this resonance. If, however, there's an additional transition and a signal pulse goes through close to that signal transition, that leads to a strong AC Stark shift modifying the level structure of the atom, which in turn detunes the probe off of resonance which means that it now sees a different index of refraction, gets a different phase shift. All right. This is generally a very small effect in dimensionless units, probably typically on the order of 10 to the minus 10. You can use resonant enhancement. Turns out you can use other tricks like electromagnetically induced transparency or in more recent experiments, uh, Rydberg atoms, to greatly amplify this thing. So we used electromagnetically induced transparency. We have a laser-cooled cloud of rubidium-85 atoms. Uh, we send through a beam to set up the EIT, and then in counter-propagating directions, we focus probe and signal pulses. Eventually, we want to do this with a heralded single photon source. At the moment, our source isn't quite bright enough, so we began with just very weak, coherent states over here. And then we did a phase measurement on the probe transmitted in the opposite direction. And this is what we got. Beginning with about 100,000 signal photons per pulse and turning the intensity down, we measured the phase shift. If there are too many photons, you saturate the atom. As you turn it down, we were able to turn it down to, on average, one photon per pulse. That's the first time a free space experiment has seen this kind of nonlinearity with uh, intensities in the order of one photon. And we see a very small phase shift on the order of 15 microradians, nevertheless measurable. <clears throat> 
So we want to go down to that one photon regime. So we'll leave the log log plots behind and look here at a case where we have five photons detuned by 18 megahertz and very clearly see a phase shift. Two photons, we see a smaller phase shift. Make sure we're not cheating ourselves. Leave the number of photons the same. Flip the sign of the detuning. The effect is supposed to be odd in detuning. Sure enough, it is. And finally, go down to the case where there is less than one photon per pulse, or rather a coherent state that has on average half a photon. But the more interesting thing is why don't we ask afterwards, did it have a photon or not? So we send that coherent state pulse to a single photon counting module, which either clicks or it doesn't click. Ideally, if it clicks, we say that was a one photon pulse. If it doesn't click, we say that was a vacuum. In reality, there are some corrections, but that's roughly accurate. And we find that when it does not click, we see almost no phase shift. And when it does click, we see a phase shift that corresponds to that one photon average. So in this post-selected sense, we've really seen the phase shift of an individual photon, an individual post-selected photon. Interruption, please. Uh, sorry, they're not what data? Actually, they are, but we'll come back to that in a second. So we started thinking about this post-selection issue more carefully. And it started thinking about sending in an incident coherent state, which could have any average incident photon number you like, and simply using Bayes' rule to calculate what we should conclude about the photon number that really was in that system before we made our detection event. And people attack me like mad for that language, but it doesn't matter. You can think about it that way or not. You can do as sophisticated a quantum mechanical calculation as you like. You get the same answer. So I'm going to use the simple-minded realist picture that since I'm trying to do a photon number measurement, there really was some number of photons in there. It began in a Poisson distribution. I learned more about it when I found out whether or not my detector clicked. And what you find is if you compare the no-click cases to the cases where you see a click, there is always a shift of one photon. If you give me a coherent state with, on average, four photons, well, when my detector clicks, I conclude that time they were probably five. And there's a simple-minded quantum optics way you can see this, which is to think that our inefficient detector is equivalent to splitting a beam into two modes at a beam splitter, one of which goes to a 100% efficient detector, and the other of which is just sent off into space, the undetected modes. <coughs> If this is a coherent state, then we have a separable state of these two modes, which means that by looking at this detector, I acquire zero information about the undetected modes. I cannot change the number of photons that I've lost. All I can do is find out whether there's zero photon here or one photon here. So that click or no click changes the photon number by exactly one. Again, I say exactly, there are some corrections when you worry about background, but this is very close to accurate for us. So in answer to Howard's question, all of those points were actually post-selected. And no matter what the incident coherent state was, we see an additional one photon's worth of nonlinear phase shift whenever our detector clicks. So we're really looking at the phase shift due to the photon that made our detector fire on top of the phase shift of all the average photons that were there in the coherent state. And we check for systematics. So now, can a single photon have the effect of 100 photons? You all know the idea of weak measurement. We're going to let our photon interact with a probe. So the probe carries some record of the um, number of photons in that signal pulse. <clears throat> in reality, I told you that that phase shift was about 15 microradians. Our single shot uncertainty is 1,000 times that. It's about 15 milliradians. So if you want a weak measurement, there's a weak measurement for you. We have to average millions of times to get any information. And already before we do that, we're post-selecting on whether or not there was a photon. But we could do better and post-select on a photon in a given state. In the standard weak value protocol, keep only the record from the pointer in the cases where the post-selection succeeds and this little green light goes off. Accumulate a distribution of pointer positions, build up a histogram and ask, what is the average shift of the pointer when the post-selection succeeds? And as most of this audience knows very well, that's given by the weak value formula, which has this interesting property that is the overlap between the initial and post-selected states tends towards zero. This expression can diverge. So that was the observation that motivated the title of this famous paper. <clears throat> 
And we decided to pick up with that and remember <laughs> that spin one half is identical, well, homologous to any other two-level system. In particular, if we're studying one photon, leave aside the coherent states for a while, imagine we were doing this with our uh, uh, heralded single photon source. If we put that photon into an interferometer with two paths, it's mathematically equivalent to a spin one half. And if we measure whether or not the photon is in path B by only letting that interact with our Kerr medium, with our atoms, then we're measuring some spin observable, right? the projector onto spin down, something similar, uh, closely related to S sub Z. So if we prepare the photon in an equal superposition of paths A and B, and post-select in a nearly orthogonal superposition of A and B, that just means we've aligned the interferometer so most of the light comes out this port, and only every now and then does a photon reach this trigger detector. It's an unlikely post-selection event. And if you work out the weak value of the number of photons in path B when you do this, you can get this amplified result that goes as one over delta, the detuning of that beam splitter from a perfect 50-50. So what that means is when the post-selection succeeds, when this detector fires and so the photon went this way, I should expect that the phase shift measured over here could be 100 times larger than the true single photon phase shift for this interaction. And in this paper, we confirmed that even if you want to calculate that using more straightforward quantum optics, the weak value theory is, of course, correct. It gives you an accurate prediction. But now we also have the experimental data, and here they are as a function of uh, one of these detuning parameters. One is where we have 100% chance of post-selection, so we just see the single photon phase shift, and these smaller numbers are for smaller and smaller post-selection probabilities, and you see that we're able to measure a phase shift that uh, in this case is as big as eight times the single photon phase shift. Again, the experiment wasn't actually done with a heralded single photon source. It was once more looking at the photon that was detected, so it's on top of a coherent state background, making the theory a little bit thorny. But in the end, when you do that subtraction of the post-selected and non-post-selected results, that's precisely what you see. So in that sense, the physical effect of this one photon, as long as you post-select it properly, really is eight times as large, obviously limited only by technical considerations, as the effect of a single photon you knew for sure was propagating through that medium. Uh, how much time do I have left? We still have uh, seven minutes plus discussion. Five minutes. Wonderful. So then I'll say a few words about whether or not this uh, weak value amplification, as it's come to be known, is useful for anything. Uh, that was speculated back from that original paper. Uh, on the other hand, it seemed for a long time like it would be difficult to turn that into a practical advantage until Paul Kuyat's group did an experiment that used weak value amplification to measure a very tiny effect never before observed, which was the spin hall effect for light. Uh, to be honest, they never proved that they needed to do it using weak measurements. They just sort of waved their hands and said, well, no one ever measured it before, and we used weak value amplification, and we measured it, so weak value amplification must have been important. And that left interesting arguments open. And groups like John Howell's experimental group in collaboration with Andrew Jordan's theory group and many other groups since then have tried to really quantify what the advantages were. Uh, this experiment I just always reproduce because the numbers boggle the mind. Um, what I like about it is you get to the end and they say that they've measured the angular deflection of a mirror down to 400 plus or minus 200 femtoradians. And Someone asked me to comment on this at the time, and I was racking my brain for how you explain what a femtoradian is, and I, I finally realized that it's even more dramatic than I had imagined at first. If I had steady enough hands and shone this laser pointer at the moon one dark night, and I only jittered by 200 femtoradians, the spot as it landed on the moon would only jitter by the thickness of a human hair. That's the precision they were able to achieve thanks to these weak measurements. Nonetheless, one can still ask, is this the optimal way of doing such measurements? Are there other ways to do it? And the short story comes down to this. Frankly, this is, this is why I never used to do these experiments. Uh, if you use weak value amplification, roughly speaking, you get a signal that grows as one over the overlap between initial and final states. Make that overlap small, you get a big signal. That should be good. 
Of course, the success probability goes as the square of that same overlap. So your data rate goes down by some large factor. So your pointer shift may get 10 times larger, but then your data rate will get 100 times smaller. And as we all know, your signal to noise goes as the square root of the number of data points you acquire. So this effect cancels out entirely. Well, what most of us used to say is, well, that's true for statistical noise, but not for technical noise. As far as I know, there is no definition of this term, technical noise. That was just our way of saying, if what I said before didn't happen for some technical reason, then it would be like this. So we thought about it more carefully, and so did people like John. Um, Howell's group suggested that things like pixel size in a detector are just insurmountable limitations. And therefore, if you need to amplify your signal to get it better than the pixel size, you do this. Fundamentally, I, I don't believe that. When you image things, in fact, it's not good to make things smaller than the pixel. It's much better to cover many pixels, do a good fit, and determine where the center is to much smaller than the size of a pixel. You still have your statistical root n gain. So that explanation isn't quite right. Um, however, what we concluded in our group is that the noise only drops as 1 over root n because there's a kind of random walk going on because every time I take a data point, I get a different value of the noise field, and those add up in quadrature, meaning that the average estimate I have for the noise goes down as, as root n. However, this assumes white noise. It assumes that the noise at every data point is entirely uncorrelated with the noise at every other data point, and that's never true in practice. There's plenty of slow noise in many systems. Typically, systems end up dominated by 1 over f noise that diverges at low frequencies. And if the noise field is correlated at different times, then taking more and more measurements actually doesn't help you at all, because every one of those measurements is now revealing the same value of the noise field. You can't average them away. So in the case of highly correlated noise, slow noise, it seemed to us that you don't want these extra data points. In other words, if you have them, you may as well throw most of them away. If I had 100 data points within one of these correlation times of the noise, why not keep only one out of 100? I don't get this root n hit over here, but if I do the post-selection right, I can amplify my signal by a factor of 10. So we believed that uh, at least if you had correlated noise, there was an advantage. And there were a number of papers, in particular by Ferry and Coombs, pointing out that weak measurement is never optimal. And there were very strong statements to this effect. And there were strong statements on the other side as well, as there always are. Um, but I want to first point out that some of this is merely a language issue. We all meant different things. A lot of the theorists analyzing this hated this word post-selection. They kept saying, how can you gain information by throwing anything out? And the point is, we weren't focusing on the throwing out. What post-selection means to me in my laboratory is I had to build a second interferometer here and buy a second detector and set up electronics to correlate the results of this detection with the phase measurement. If that wasn't worth it, we wouldn't go to all that trouble. And what the theorists were calculating is if you had already gone to that trouble, is there a better way you could have analyzed your data without throwing anything out, keep the entire data set? My answer to which is, well, of course. If I have the whole data set, then I'm going to get more information by keeping all of it than by keeping a subset. The interesting question is, are there regimes where I get most of the information from a small subset? The other interesting question is, was it worth my while to build this apparatus in the first place? Should I be doing these correlation measurements in general? Whether you do the simple correlation measurement, which is weak value amplification, or a more sophisticated correlation measurement, which keeps the entire data set. So my contention is that there are at least, and probably not many more, than three types of situations where the weak value amplification is useful. There's a trivial one that no one mentions, but we probably should, which is if you're limited by detector saturation. If I have a 10-watt laser and a detector that can't count more than a million photons per second, I'm going to turn the laser intensity down, or I'm going to attenuate the laser. If I'm throwing away those photons anyway, wouldn't I rather do it by using an intelligent post-selection and getting the weak value amplification. Of course I would. So if you have to throw something away, throw it away intelligently. That's the moral of that story. Uh, I think there's another case where you simply have a, something like the coherent state I described before. If my coherent state had an intensity much less than one photon per pulse, then most of the time I would just be measuring noise. If I could correlate with a detection, I could just ignore all those pulses that were looking at noise, and I'd get much better statistics by only looking, thank you, at the cases with those. <laughs>
anyway, I will happily talk more about this with other people later, but for now I'm going to speed through so I can at least show you some pictures of our next experiment. As a function of this photon rate, or equivalently the degree of noise correlation, if you plot what I think of as the signal-to-noise ratio, what purists insist on calling the Fisher information, what you find is that if you just do blind averaging, this lowest curve, it increases with the photon rate until you hit one photon per correlation time. And then it begins to saturate. You just don't gain by averaging more photons. If you do weak value amplification, that curve continues to grow until you have one post-selected photon per correlation time. So there's a definite advantage. On the other hand, if you take that correlated data set and you just do something a little smarter, it turns out you can do even better than the weak value amplification. And that's because of the counterintuitive fact that if you're smart about it, correlations in the noise can help you. Basically, you can use those correlations to do what experimentalists know as lock-in amplification. And what we see now is the lock-in amplification is even better than the weak value amplification. But in some sense, perhaps it's more complicated. Either of these correlation techniques, though, give you a definite advantage. So in the two minutes that, that remain, I just want to show you some pictures of what we're setting up to do next, which is watching a particle in a region it's forbidden to be in. So here's Heisenberg tunneling through a wall, and uh, he's going to look at his clock at the end and see how long it takes a tunneling particle to uh, be transmitted through a tunnel barrier. One of the quite old proposals for measuring this, because it's been a controversial question since 1932, is to have a particle carrying a spin that interacts with a magnetic field localized in a barrier and therefore processes by some amount. Boudicca reanalyzed this in 83 and noticed that not only does the particle process about the magnetic field as you expect, but it also tends to align with the field. And confused by the fact that there were two components, he simply declared that you should add them in quadrature, and that was the tunneling time. Um, there were other approaches, such as the Feynman path approach, that also led to two components, in that case, a real and an imaginary part, which most people simply ridiculed, saying, who's ever seen complex numbers on the face of a stopwatch? However, it turns out that Boudicca's time, this Larmor time, is exactly the same as the Feynman approach and is the same as the weak value approach which, as most of you know, has real and imaginary parts as well, but which we now know how to interpret quite accurately, whereas in 1983, we did not. So we want to do an experiment like this, measure the time in different regions by moving that magnetic field. And the prediction that we have is that if you look at transmitted particles, that's this green curve, you'll see that the particles spend almost no time near the center of the barrier Yet the transmitted particles do spend time near the exit, while the reflected particles, the red curve, only see the entrance. Now, let me skip a little bit. The idea is to take Bose condensed atoms, drop them through a barrier formed of light, and see them tunnel. Here's an early experiment where our atoms were trapped on top of a barrier made of light and under the influence of gravity. First, the hottest ones fall through. Those don't count. And then eventually, they spread out and fall off the ends of the table. Right now, there are probably a few tunneling through there, but the barrier was still too thick for us to observe that. In more recent experiments, we've observed tunneling in a slightly different geometry. But now we have to set up that localized magnetic field. We're going to use Raman coupling of two levels as a fictitious magnetic field so that we can focus those beams eventually inside the barrier to really probe these things. And let a cloud of atoms tunnel through a barrier along with those Raman probes after which we'll be able to see how much did the spin of each atom get rotated by doing a Stern-Gerlach measurement. And here's data showing that my students have actually learned how to do those Stern-Gerlach measurements. So little by little, we're assembling all the hardware we need to do this. And the last thing we managed to do is at least calibrate the Larmor clock without any tunnel barrier at all. And we confirmed a very important equation, given that in my field, people like you know, proving that 15 is 3 times 5. We proved that the time spent in a region is equal to the length of the region divided by the velocity of the particle. It's not a very high resolution fit, but basically it confirms that formula. So I'll uh, leave you with my summary slide. And since I think I ran over time a little, I won't read you my conclusions, but just open it up to questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.